welcome to our event, Choice Words, Writers on Abortion. We have some folks here in person, also folks watching online, also folks watching later as this is being recorded. Um, for those who are not familiar, welcome to Haymarket House. Um, or a cultural and community event space here in Chicago. So hopefully you come back if this is your first event. Um, and this is a long overdue book launch. So <laughs> Choice Words originally came out in the spring of 2020. There was a lot happening in the world in spring of 2020. Mm. So this is our first in-person book event here in Chicago. Um, we're really excited to have it. And we're also really excited that we're part of the Chicago Abortion Fund, Fundathon. Um, month? Many months. Many months. <laughs> Perpetual fundathon because you can always fund Chicago Abortion Fund. So this is a special fundraiser event um, for them as well. Um, before we begin our program, I do want to start with some acknowledgments. First, that Haymarket House events take place on the occupied lands of the Council of the Three Fires Tribes, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, who are the indigenous keepers of this land, who through acts of genocide and dispossession have been forcibly removed to found the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago. But we also must acknowledge that settler colonialism is not simply relegated to the dustbin of history, continues today. And we stand in solidarity with the people of Gaza who are experiencing ongoing genocide and dispossession, <laughs> as well as all the students around the country who are occupying their college campuses more each day um, to protest and demand a ceasefire, and who in several instances are being brutally repressed by the police and their own college administrations. Again today. Again today. Um, so we are living in dark times, and coming together in community in spaces like this is really important and sustaining for us in our work. Uh, one of the bright lights in these challenging times um, that have been challenging for a while for reproductive justice is the abortion, Chicago Abortion Fund. With the attacks on reproductive justice, the bans on abortions, and the anti-LGBTQIA restrictions happening around the country, Chicago Abortion Fund is truly a beacon. The Chicago Abortion Fund boldly affirms a person's right to bodily autonomy and provides much needed financial, logistical, and emotional support to people seeking abortions in Chicago, Illinois, and now the whole Midwest, because we are really a state in the Midwest that continues to have access to abortion when many of our sister states do not. Please donate if you can to support their work. All the ticket sales from this event were donated today. And now I want to introduce our speakers, and then I will get out of the way. Um, so first and foremost, we're very delighted to have with us Annie Finch. Yay. <laughs> Annie is a poet, cultural critic, and performance artist. Her work includes six volumes of poetry, writings on matriarchal, matriarchal spirituality, mm -hmm. and the ritual verse play on abortion among the goddesses, an epic libretto in seven dreams, which received the Sarasvati Award. Annie, did I said that probably wrong? Annie earned a PhD from Stanford University and has written widely on feminist issues in a poetic form. Through her poetry, Witch Ritual Theater, she has collaborated with artists in theater, dance, and music to offer rituals including abortion healing. She teaches meter and magic at metermagicspiral.org and travels widely to teach and perform. Thank you for being with us, Amy, mm -hmm. and for moderating and being part of this conversation, leading this conversation. Yeah. And then let me move to the side a little bit. <laughs> uh, Deborah Bruce is the author of four poetry books. Um, most recently, Survivor's Picnic. She has published widely in journals, including The Atlantic, Poetry, Shenandoah, and Women's Studies Quarterly. She has recent and forthcoming poems in Presence, a journal of Catholic poetry, and Ecto Ecotone. Ecotone. This is where, like, Dane is not a poet. I apologize. Um, Deborah is a professor emeritus at Northeastern Illinois University, where her great love was teaching poetry in traditional forms. Some of her sonnets were included in Annie Finch's first anthology of formal poetry by women, A Formal Feeling Comes, in 1994. So y'all have known each other a minute. Mm -hmm. During her years in Chicago, Deborah has been awarded the Carl Sandburg Award, the Gwendolyn Brooks Award, and grants from the Illinois Arts Council. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Ooh, I heard a door. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sin 
Salak. Is that how you say your last name? Salach. Sin Salach is a poet of page and stage. I love that. Mm -hmm. Illinois Arts Council recipient, four time Ragdale Fellow, and nominee for voiceover and on screen narration of the PBS documentary From Schoolboy to Showgirl. Sin has collaborated with musicians, video artists, dancers, photographers, and most recently healers, chefs, and scientists for over 30 years. She was honored to be the inaugural Poet Laureate of Covenant Farm in Sawyer, Michigan. Her two books of poetry, Looking for a Soft Place to Land and When I Am Yes, are housed there in the Porch Swing Poetry Box. Sin leads circles of women writers in a monthly workshop called Splitting the World Open, inspired by the quote, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? The world would split open. Muriel, <coughs> Muriel Rukeyser. Rukeyser, thank you. Again, <laughs> love the quote. I am the first time hearing it. That's great. She also creates workshops, poetry experiences for caregivers and those with dementia and Alzheimer's, helping people voice their deepest truths with poetry. They are the most afraid is the work she has always felt called to do. So poetic. Thank you, Sin, for being with us. <laughs> And Alicia Hurtado is a queer Latinx organizer based in Chicago with the Chicago Abortion Foundation. They are deeply committed to abolition and reproductive justice organizing as a means of achieving bodily autonomy and liberation for all people. Alicia has been building power as a staff member at Chicago Abortion Fund since 2020, where they currently serve as the movement building director. At CIF, Alicia leads the organization's political advocacy and grassroots organizing strategy for the world in which all people can not only access abortion and other reproductive care, but also live their full lives in safe, resourced, and affirming communities. Outside of their work with CIF, they serve on the advisory team at Dissenters, woo -woo, another awesome org, a youth-powered nationwide anti-militarism movement with Chicago Roots. Welcome, everybody. What a fabulous group of wonderful humans who are going to talk about all things poetic, all things justice, all things reproductive justice, and I will leave now. <laughs> Woo, Dana! It's great to be here, finally to do something at Haymarket House about Choice Words, which is a book that took 20 years to put together and arrived on the scene just as they were about to destroy abortion rights. So it has become more and more and more important uh, over the 20 years that I was editing it and then in the last four years since it, it came out. It came out right on the eve of COVID, so it has had a soft launch, but is uh, starting to make its way into the abortion conversation. I'm glad to hear that because I put this book together realizing there was nothing else like it in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. I had an abortion in 1999, and afterwards, as a poet, as a lover of literature, I was looking for a way to process this experience, such an incredibly deep and important experience, and there was nothing. I mean, I have a PhD in literature and there really was basically nothing. There were two or three individual poems, fantastic poems by great poets, so I shouldn't say nothing, but they were like mm -hmm. isolated. They were not considered part of a movement. Um, so when you think about it, it's really crazy. Abortion is a psychological, moral, moral spiritual, cultural reality. It navigates death and life. It should be one of the great themes of literature, and I think it is, and I think it will continue to be. As I was putting the book together, I put out calls from so many writers, and I discovered that there really wasn't, there was a few things published that were hidden within larger works of literature. There were unpublished things. There were also writers who wanted to write about abortion and had never had the courage before. So I started hearing from writers saying, I've been wanting to write about this my whole life. Now that you're editing this book, I'll do it. So there are things in this book that you know, exist only because of this book, which it, it's kind of amazing. And it, I think it shows us the way literature is 
a tribal activity. Like when we start to write about certain things, we make other people become aware suddenly of things yeah. they didn't know that they could write about. Right. And so that's just one reason I'm so grateful to all the people who contributed. Over the years, this anthology grew to encompass liter lyric and narrative poems, plays, short stories, tweets, memoir, flash fiction, rituals, journals, excerpts from novels. There are writers from the 16th through the 21st centuries, five centuries mm -hmm. across six continents, across ethnicities, genders, cultures, sexualities, including US writers of so many backgrounds, voices from Bulgaria, China, England, Finland, India, Iran, Ireland, Kenya, Northern Ireland, Pakistan, Romania, Saudi Arabia, Scotland, South Africa, Sudan, Syria. And they all show how abortion intersects with issues of class, race, ethnicity, wealth and poverty and faith. They all ex impact our understanding and our experience of abortion. The range is phenomenal. There are texts like Blandiana's Children's Crusade, which was published right before abortion was outlawed in Romania, like an incredibly impactful, impactful piece at the time. And then there are there is a, a poem made out of uh, teenage girls in the Congo talking about their experiences mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, the isolation that they felt. There are pieces that are as old as Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, Maria or the Wrongs of Women, which have the same exact story as Amy Tan's story about China not mm -hmm. that long ago. The same tale of a woman being raped, gotten pregnant, raped by an uh, employer, master, owner, whatever, and having to leave and ending up committing suicide because of the abortion. The same tales, the same themes, the same stories coming out in so many different cultures. It's, it's just mind-blowing. And the writers included include Margaret Atwood, Ruth Prower Jabala, Ursula Le Guin, Gloria Naylor, Joyce Carol Oates, Ejizaki Shange, Leslie Marmon Silko, Amy Tan, Mo Yan, Audre Lorde, so many more. And the themes of all of these different voices as I was editing began to come together into this kind of a chorus and it, it wasn't even about the words or the mind anymore, it became like a chorus of the heart. I, I feel that this issue is so foundational to human freedom because it's foundational to the freedom of more than half of the human race, which is still nowhere near where even equality would have it. And, and then if you go back into the, the before the 5, 000, last 5,000 years or so, patriarchy was not a thing. I mean, I've studied so much about matriarchy and mm -hmm. it helps you understand that abortion and reproductive self-determination is foundational to human culture. Mm -hmm way, 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 thousands and thousands of years. There's a history of this being a sacred responsibility over death and life, which gives females a ton, or people who have children, so much sacred power, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's only like the last 5,000 years that patriarchy has come into being. But the human species is way, way older than that. It was matriarchal, it really was. Mm -hmm. There's so much evidence of this increasing. Um, the scholarship in Germany, Heidi Guttner Abendrop, scholars in this field. And you can just see that the ideas that most of us have about um, reproductive freedom and about patriarchy and sexism are just not true. People say things like, oh, the world's always been patriarchal. Nope, no way. It's very, very recent. And when you look at the history, for example, of Ireland, which is a place that was totally matriarchal because it was an isolated island, until very recently, really, 1100 AD, when they started to, um, the patriarchy came in. It came in through nationalism, it came in through capitalism, and it came in through war. So the combination of the military, the church, and the nationalism came in, and they took this matriarchal culture, turned it patriarchal, and guess what the first thing they did was? Got rid of abortion rights. In Ireland, originally, the goddess Bridget was like, the stories, Bridget was like enabling women to have abortions. Like it was a, it was a thing that was sacred. It was totally um, 
part of the culture. And then the first thing that the patriarchy did just about was start to chip away at that freedom. And it was the leading edge and everything else, all of the other freedoms, mm -hmm. democracies started to fall. And you ended up with an autocratic, violent, oppressive culture. So it's not just an issue that belongs over here. It's a central issue for human freedom. Mm -hmm. When I put this book together, I organized it into five sections. I thought a lot about how to organize it. First, I thought chronologically, but I didn't want to do that. Uh, I didn't want to start with the, the earlier stuff. And, and I didn't want to do it alphabetically. I wanted to do it in a way that anyone could pick up and immediately find what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. I imagined it as a book that would be helpful for individuals going through the abortion process, but also helpful for those who want to study on a more communal level and organize and use it for activism, uh, a book that could be more like the vagina monologues where people could come together around it and um, use it to you know, work for freedom and also on the largest level, a book just for understanding, for a cultural understanding. So I wanted all these different uses, but I wanted, I went, imagined it in abortion clinics so that someone's going through this, they can pick it up and begin to, you know, just pick it up at random and find something that mm -hmm. speaks to you and makes you feel you're not alone, helps you process your experience. So I finally decided to organize it according to the categories that I have come to love as a practicing witch. So I do ritual circles, and uh, we cast a sacred circle that's connected to the will, mind, body, heart, and spirit in the five different directions. So you call on the spirits of the south, the east, the north, the west, the center. And as you do that, you can connect with your own power in your will, your mind, your body, your heart, and your spirit. So when I put this book together, Finally, um, at, at the end of the process, I was still doing a slightly different order. Now I've changed it, but it's so the order in this book is mind, body, heart, will, spirit. And I got so many thousands of submissions that I was looking through to find the pieces that were really alive. I got lots and lots of pieces, and a lot of them were people describing their own experiences, and there, a lot of it was very traumatic, and they kind of wanted to just get their experience out, which is fine, it's great, there's other books that do that, but I didn't include those pieces in the book that were really just primarily about someone processing their experience. I wanted to find pieces where the processing of the experience turned into art, great writing, great, great, great writing. What is great writing? It takes the personal experience, and it's like this alchemy. It turns it into something that that has its own identity that begins to feed us, that gives us a kind of um, of of gravity. It's like it meets us. It meets us with something that takes us out of ourselves and makes us remember whether that we're part of a human culture, part of a spiritual culture. And I feel like it gives you back some strength as you're, as you're reading it. Um, that is above and beyond what any individual uh, person's story could do. So I feel that every piece in here really does that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was hard to decide, does a piece belong with mind, body, heart, will, or spirit? There's a lot of overlap, obviously. But um, in the mind section, I really wanted to include pieces that talk about the decision to have an abortion, what goes into that decision, so many different things, whether it's income level or belief, uh, religious belief, family situation, the circumstances under which you got pregnant. But uh, the mind is about that. The heart is about the emotional experience. So much of that was about who comes with you to the abortion. What's the support system that you have? Is it often in these stories and poems, it's a mother or a best friend uh, or someone like, let's say, Audre Lorde come, had a teacher who supported her. There's usually someone, very rarely a man, I've gotten actually questions about that. Um, mm -hmm. Not usually the the, um, the other parent of the child. It's mm -hmm. usually someone more in your support system. Mm -hmm. uh, then, the, then there's the, um, the body, the physical experience, all the totally different experiences physically that people have, whether they're in a hospital, whether they're going through a traumatic thing, whether it's simple, whether it's at home, whether it's legal or illegal, all these things, the culture. 
One of my favorite pieces in the body section is about someone having an abortion. It's the Ruth by Ruth Prower Jabala talking about a midwife and doing this massage and it's just this really beautiful, peaceful mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. that's actually a nourishing experience. Mm -hmm. And then there's the spirit, which is like the, the whole spiritual context of abortion, very important to me uh, personally. So all of these different aspects of abortion are in the book. And I think for me, the, the most important thing about reading everything in this book together is that it gives you the sense of our choice, not only choice over our reproductive choices, but also choice over how they're going to be, what they're going to look like. Like, when you read so many different cultures and different ways of handling abortion, thinking about it, doing it, it makes you realize that we can really choose the kind of abortion we want to have in our own lives and in our culture. It does not have to be a traumatic experience of shame and guilt. It does not have to be isolating. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, we can decide in our own lives and as a culture what we want to have. And uh, for me, the ritual, the spiritual aspect is important. But for some people, it's really not. There's a great story in here about Bulgaria, where um, this, uh, the author was, or the speaker is having breakfast with this woman in Bulgaria, who's like, oh, I had an abortion this morning, then I went to the dentist, da -di -da -di -da. <laughs> And she's like, whoa, this is really blowing my mind, because in our culture, it's a big deal. You know, even if you decide to do it, it's often a big deal. Uh, but in Eastern Europe, not at all. It's just, and then she ends that story saying, well, you know, I take a pill every day so I won't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Is it mm -hmm. really, is that any better morally to mess up my body every day to just have a couple of abortions over my lifetime? Big deal. So it's so much up to the individual yeah. and also I think so much to open to, to groups of individuals, to us as a society, mm -hmm. how we want to do it. Um, some of the common themes, and I'll just close close my little intro here by just sharing a couple of the things that were surprising to me as I started reading the literature. Um, the idea that abortion is an act of love. Mm. We don't always think of it that way. Uh, it's certainly presented by anti-abortion people as a selfish act. So often it is not. The majority of abortions are actually by people who are already mothers, I believe. Alicia, you can tell us if that's true. Mm. Um, mm. And so, in so many of these stories talk about abortion as an act of love for the unborn child, for the self, uh, as just a choice made out of great wisdom. And I have so much faith in the wisdom of people who are pregnant, uh, who are in this state where you are kind of open and, and full of love to make a choice in a, in, a, in a way that's not at all about the individual ego that is just so off base. And so much of that in this book. It's very moving. Abortion is a normal human activity over times, so over centuries, over continents. Uh, abortion as a symbol and an archetype, it's often been presented that way in the white male literature like Ernest Hemingway's Hills Like White Elephants, things like that. They treat an abortion as like a symbol. I didn't put pieces like that in the book. I only wrote pieces that really had the compassion to be from the perspective of the person having the abortion. There are two men in the book, Langston Hughes and Frank O'Hara, and a few people gender fluid, but mostly it is from the point of view of, uh, of cis women, who I think are most of the people who get pregnant. Um, at the time, actually, I worked really hard to find uh, trans men, could not find at the time. Maybe mm -hmm. four years later it would be different. But I went to many organizations, looked and looked and looked for this literature. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think there will be a sequel. Maybe that'll be in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, another theme that came up was the mo emotional complexity. And I think often people think, well, if you have, on the right, they often say, well, it's bad for women, to, bad for people to have abortion because it's so emotionally traumatic. Major thing that came up here was you can have something emotionally very complex that does not mean it's the wrong thing to do. Uh, feelings can evolve, but I think out of all of the you know, all of the things I discovered, the importance of support was the most surprising one for me. That having that loving support makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's uh, one of the most important things that comes out of here. So I just feel that uh, to bring the power of literature to bear on the topic of abortion can really change the conversation. Uh, the political conversation seems to have gotten into kind of a stalemate. Uh, there's a lot of stereotypes on both sides, projection on both sides, and I think when you actually read the literature of the great, great, great writers who have transformed this topic, um, it just doesn't allow those stereotypes to persist. It becomes more of a question of opening your heart, opening your soul. And there is a discussion guide for this book, and I have had the honor to participate in several discussions about the book, and it's just so moving to see how people bring their personal experiences into the conversation. And um, there's, it's just a, a really special experience to, to have a book about something so, so complex and private, and yet have people come together over it. There's also an activist guide, and I think you know the book could really have potential to uh, bring people together to talk about abortion and appreciate the importance of it in a way that is nuanced, complex, and does not shut anything down, but instead opens up possibilities. So I'm really excited to have two contributors here, Deborah Bruce and Sin Salak. Um, Salak. <laughs> I answer to anything. Come it's fun. <laughs> I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> and I, they're both amazing writers, and uh, we're going to talk about favorite pieces in the book by someone else, and also share our own pieces. So there'll be readings of just a few, I guess a total of six little pieces. Alicia, you'll be talking about Chicago Abortion Fund. We'll probably wait until we've um, had the meetings and people are really aware of the importance of the work that you're doing with us. And you can talk about that. And of course we love your opinions and thoughts as well. Mm -hmm. at that point. So um, the, one of the earliest poems in the pieces in the book is Sin uh, Salach, incredible poem. And I thought it would be fun to start off with that. Actually it's the very first piece in the mm -hmm. book. It's called You Are Here. So why don't you start us off with that? Do you want me to read that one yeah. first or the one that yeah. I... That one first. Okay. okay. And then we'll go back and talk. Thank you, Annie. First of all, I just want to say how grateful I am that you have done this work. Um, it's tremendous, and I think the ripples of it are going to just keep... We're just going to keep feeling them and experiencing them. And as you say, there will be a part two. <laughs> so many more. Um, and I'm so grateful that you brought up love at the very... that. Um, it is not something, I think, a word that's often associated with abortion by e maybe even either side. I don't know. Um, I know abortion was an act of the greatest. Um, and now that she's at this fence, I do want to say that the person that came with me was the obvious, um, a truly wonderful human man. Um, and so I'm grateful for that too. So I'm sitting here, gratitude's coming up. But um, when Annie reached out and asked me if I would consider being a part of this, um, which of course took me less than half of a second to say yes, yes, please. Um, it was this poem in particular, You Are Here, um, which I believe I wrote in around early 90s. Um, I was trying to go back to see what was going on in the, there was a case up with the Supreme Court with Planned Parenthood, and restrictions were starting to get heavy. It was really starting to be chipped away at, but I'm sure you have much more, but that's what I remember. Um, I was also doing more performance then, and there was um, a good friend of mine who was anti-choice. Um, and we would have many heated, heated conversations about, because he was also pro, capital punishment, and, I, and we would just have these conversations about it, and, I, and we kept trying to create an environment where we could agree to disagree, where um, that we could just take down the heatedness and really try to understand and listen to each other's hearts. And I remember saying to him, you know, that he was talking about capital punishment and laws, and, and I said, well, you know, I don't not 
kill someone because it's the law. <laughs> I don't need a law to tell me not to do that. Um, I know in my body what is the right thing to do and not the right thing to do. And that is, I think, that and all the protests that were starting and my own, um, my own beginning to understand my truth and where it comes from and my own power and how to use my voice. And so that, I believe, is where this poem came from. The poem is in two parts, and the first part is the opening poem of the book, um, but I'm going to read the whole poem tonight. You are here. O oh, land of the free, home of the brave, how much courage does it take to hurl lies and threats and boasts at those who do not agree with those who do not agree? How much more courage would it take to hold each other in each other's arms, reminding ourselves we're all made of flesh, whispering into each other's lives, I disagree with you, but I respect you. Or, I disagree with you, but I love you. Or, I disagree with you, but I will not ram my sign down your throat so your voice is silenced and only... Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Listen to you, listen to you, listen to you, listen to you. Listen to me, listen to you, listen to me, listen to you. This chorus of voices, let's call them ideas. Let's call them demands. Let's call them rights and wrongs and lefts and rights. This chorus of voices, let's call them ours and sing at the top of our lungs. You belong to me. You belong to me. And I shall name you mine. Where does life begin? All the time. With every breath. Things start over. At what moment does conception become reality, become flesh, become mine? Would I need a stopwatch to know? A so, so, so precise way of measuring time, counting down to the last millisecond. Three, two, one, 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 push, breathe. Congratulations. It's a light bulb, right? Mine. This is America. If you can't stand the freedom, Get out of the country. If I could step outside myself, see myself as others do, what would I notice first? A woman? Familiar curves, anxiously following orders to go this way or that? A certain silhouette that takes up a certain space everywhere she goes? Would I be able to make better choices about what was best for me if I had a more objective point? If I could step outside myself, it would certainly make it a lot easier to see what was going on inside myself. The stormy parts where the world crashes and groans, pulling at my conscience, aching for growth. The quiet places where the sun fingers sleep softly, waking for conversation, aching for, for more. The so small you can only see them from here places that are still being born. All my first steps and the future with its high ceilings and bare floors, shades of blue and gold and purple, making circles of time I can slip comfortably into when the moment is at last ready for me. If I could step outside myself, I could see all this and more. Point out the flabby parts where I'm too wide, too narrow, the places where I am most vulnerable, the places where I am not. This is my if I have a choice to make, I count on it to tell me the truth. No other part of my body has that responsibility. No other part of my body knows me that well. This is my heart, and I have to answer to it. Not you, not the media, not the president of the country, not the Supreme Court. This is my heart. If I have a choice to make, I count on it to tell me the truth. No other part of my body has that responsibility. No other part of my body knows me that well. This is my heart. It is bound only by the laws of my soul. This is my heart. And it cannot. It cannot. It cannot. This is my heart. And it cannot be overturned.
I wish I didn't have to read it again. Yeah. I wish there were no reason for art like this. Right. But mm -hmm. here we are. I think this would actually be a great moment to hear from you, Alicia, about the, the Chicago Abortion mm -hmm. Fund. Mm -hmm. if, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, hello everyone. I'm just, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I think that I 100% agree that the conversation between art and movement isn't necessarily two separate conversations, but should always be one conversation. Um, something that, oh wow, I just want to take a breath really quick. I'm yeah. like, whew. I have so many things to say, but I'll start off with just talking about what the Chicago Abortion Fund is and what we do. Um, and I'm also happy if you all have questions or if anybody else has questions, um, always happy to answer them. Um, but the Chicago Abortion Fund is one of over 100 abortion funds across the country. We're Illinois statewide abortion fund. And as people likely know, Illinois has for a long time, as Dana said, been a regional access point for abortion care mainly because there were already existing restrictions in the region, even before Roe versus like waiting periods mm -hmm. where people had to go to two different appointments to access care. Mm -hmm. It's things like trap laws that shut down abortion clinics. So there actually weren't many abortion clinics surrounding us. Mm -hmm. It's things like parental consent or notification laws that require young people to notify or get the consent of a guardian before getting care. And we're really lucky in Illinois that we don't have many of those restrictions for folks and have worked really hard to make that the case. Um, but of course, with that comes when national and federal protections for abortion are overturned, that means that we become a national access point for abortion care. So routinely, we at the Chicago Abortion Fund are seeing people come from as far as Texas, Tennessee, Florida, all the way to Illinois to access mm -hmm. the abortions that they want and they need and they deserve. Um, we're able to help folks in a couple of different ways. Um, primarily, we support folks with financial support. If people don't know, getting an abortion can be very expensive. Um, kind of on the low end, it could be hundreds of dollars. On the high end, it could be thousands of dollars if you require hospital-based mm -hmm. care for mm -hmm. non life abortion. Um, and we're able to support folks with filling those gaps, whether it's through our funding or connecting them with other funds. Um, we can also support folks with, I, we, I always say wraparound support, which I think goes a little mm -hmm. bit with what you said about, you know, truly wrapping and enveloping people in the support and care that they need. Um, but that can look like a lot of different things. It can look like kind of those brass task, brass tacks logistics. So thinking about lodging, thinking about travel, thinking about um, childcare, because like you said, mm -hmm. the majority of people that we support and the majority of people who have abortions are already parenting. Um, we can support with meals, we can support with pain medication, pads, really whatever someone might need to get from point A to point B to honestly sometimes point C of their abortion care journey. Mm -hmm. um, as you might already think or um, I guess be able to guess, um, as people are traveling longer and longer distances, that also means just more things can come up and go wrong. So people's car can break down, their child care falls through, their job won't let them call off of work. And we're really lucky to have an amazing team that individually works with each person and is able to kind of guide them every step of the way, um, which brings me to kind of our third bucket of support, which is emotional support. Um, of course, everybody, which I think is something that we really appreciate about the book too, is every single person going through the experience of accessing abortion care has their own story, their own orientation to the care that they're getting. And really our job is to step in and alleviate any of the stress or as much of the stress as we can from the barriers that are being imposed on people right now. Mm -hmm. um, but that also means that everyone we talk to has different emotional needs surrounding their abortion care. So Kind of on the internal side, we host monthly abortions, uh, post-abortion community circles. So if anybody is interested in being in community, um, whether you've recently had an abortion or it's been a long time, and you just want to talk to other people who have had abortions, those happen typically every second Tuesday. We're going to have one on May 14th at 7.30. It's virtual, so folks can join from anywhere, and they do join from everywhere. Um, the other piece of that is that we can connect folks to one-on-one um, -on -one support, options counseling if they're not sure if they want to have an abortion. We can 
spiritual care, if that's something that they're interested in. But really at the end of the day, I think what we do, um, which is why I feel like I always go into a little bit of a spiel every time I talk about our work, is we connect with people as people, we ask them what they need, and we do what we can to get them what they need. And we move mountains alongside the folks that we work with um, to get them to the care that they deserve. And it's getting harder and harder. I do want to name just what we're facing right now, which is not a moment of crisis, but I think an era of crisis. Um, we're seeing some, we're seeing folks every day on our helpline going through really traumatic and just disheartening barriers to accessing care. Mm -hmm. And what we always try and communicate to people is that these barriers are not moral failings. They don't mean that the care that you're accessing is not care that you 100% deserve to have. It is a systemic failure and these people in power are failing you. You are not failing anyone. Um, but it, it can feel that way if you know, you're doing everything you can to access this care, going across multiple state lines, figuring out all these pieces, something falls apart. It can feel like it's your fault. Um, and yeah, I think I always feel a lot of um, just, I feel really honored and I feel a lot of responsibility, especially in the times when I'm connecting with someone who I know that I'm the only person that they have to tell me what they're going through. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wish it wasn't that way. Um, so I guess that's all to say. Um, I really appreciate when we do get to open up conversations about abortion because I think that that's something that we work with folks all the time on is just identifying who in your life can support you through this. We, of course, can support with things, but it's always much more comforting to have someone who you know holding your hand through this. And sometimes people have that, sometimes people don't. Um, but if you can make yourself available for someone else to be that person, that's so powerful. Um, and then the other thing that I will say is, um, which I think I started to say and then tangented myself <laughs> away from it, is just that uh, we really, unfortunately, are, are expecting things to get worse before they get better. We're looking ahead to these high profile abortion cases that were, the one that was just heard this week, Tala, which is kind of surrounding um, emergency abortion care. Um, and we're not necessarily expecting that to go our way with the, the justices that are seated. We're also looking in just about a week towards a six week ban in Florida, which you might think wouldn't impact us here in Illinois, but we know that already folks are making plans with how they're gonna get people here because states closer to them have more restrictions and it just makes sense to get people to states where they can get their appointment without having to wait 18 hours to get that care. So that's all to say, I think abortion bans everywhere affect all of us. We all have a community responsibility to get people to the abortion care that they, again, deserve. I feel like I keep saying that, but I think it can get lost. Um, and for us, we really appreciate all the community support we've gotten. I know Dana mentioned this. We're doing our largest fundraiser of the year. It's a huge peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser where folks can set up their own pages. And I think the beauty of that is that we encourage folks to go into their own communities and talk about why it's so important for abortion funds to be resourced and the fact that abortion funds exist, which a lot of people don't know about. Um, and we're trying to raise $300,000. It's match week this week, so if anyone's interested in donating, um, your donation could be doubled if you're interested in starting a page. It's a great time to get involved and really get that momentum. Um, but I'm happy, I don't know, maybe I can like <laughs> send the link for it to be like sent out to all the, mm -hmm. the videos and things that are swirling around, but um, that's all to say, I think it's really beautiful to hear, um, and I'm so excited to hear um, these pieces read out loud because I do think um, talking about abortion is the first step. Talking about abortion publicly, talking about your advocacy public publicly is the first step. And then the second step is how are we gonna get people to access care in a world that is trying so hard mm -hmm. right now with all of these bans, restriction, and really like white supremacy in action to try and prevent people from exercising their own autonomy. And I feel like when we bridge those two things, 
and really center the folks who are, are facing the most barriers right now, that's where we start to kind of tease out, okay, what's the plan, what do we, what do, we do? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, very grateful to be here, grateful to be with Chicago Abortion Fund, and thank you, thank you <laughs> uh, for, for having me. Thank you, thank you. Both, you know, inspiring and also yeah. terrifying yes. to hear about the importance yes. of the work you're doing and what you're facing. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for what you're doing and for sharing this. And I'm, I know people are excited to know that they can help. I mean, you've been leading and have such an impact. It'll be doubled right now. Yeah. That's incredible. And every dollar, sorry, just <laughs> but every dollar we raise really, it, it will go directly to paying for abortions, paying for folks to travel. Mm -hmm. it will, it's abortion support, abortion funding is mutual aid. And I think that that is something that um, is also just very important to resource. I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I, I really <laughs> And you mentioned having a page, so how does that work? You can set up a page and then people can keep donating through you? Is that yes, yeah, about? we do it a little bit like a competition if you want to get a little competitive <laughs> with it. Um, but yeah, you can set up your own by your own narrative as well in there, which I think is beautiful. Oh, that's really great. Thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. so we'll do it. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, well, uh, Deborah Bruce, a magnificent poet, has a poem in this book as well, in the mind section. Why don't we talk about that first? Okay, and then all right, okay. We're gonna talk about, share our own pieces, and then we're gonna talk about one favorite piece in the mm -hmm. book our, uh, that we each have. Okay. And then we have some time for questions. Okay, well, I have mine copied in large print because <laughs> I cannot read the book directly <laughs> except with a huge fire. I'm hoping, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did bring my book with me, but I, I didn't, it didn't seem like there's a lot of room on the table, so I didn't put it up here. <laughs> um, this is not an explicitly political poem, at least I don't think of it that way, because I don't write that kind of poetry, and I was a little, actually a little anxious about coming here tonight because of that. It's not I, the idea that I would be speaking in public on especially this particular topic, which is so, so supercharged uh, and with so much anger and, and it's just really something that's very painful to, it, it, almost impossible to try to have a discussion with someone about it, even people that you know. Um, but um, uh, <laughs> anyway, so my poem, is, it's not about a personal experience per se, it's not about my own having had an abortion, although I did back in the heyday of what felt like uh, eternal freedom for women. Um, when I was in graduate school in the 1970s, I had no um, question that should I accidentally become pregnant, not that it was anything I ever thought about because I was very careful, but um, when I did unfortunately become pregnant once, I knew that I could go to a clinic in the town I was in, which at the time was Iowa City, because I was at the Iowa workshop, and there was a clinic. I just looked it up today to make sure it still exists. It was the Emma Gold Clinic, mm -hmm. and it's still there, thank God. Um, I don't remember what's, I don't know what's going on in Iowa. You probably don't know what kind of access women have, but at any rate, it's still there, and um, it brought back a lot of memories, um, but I didn't write anything about it at the time, and I think for me, the reason as a poet was that I knew that it probably, well, at the time, I don't think I was even interested, but even years later when I started thinking about things, and, and I knew so many women who'd had abortions, and I had had students come to me, and one of my students once asked me to accompany her because she had no one to go with her to get her abortion. This was many years later. And so uh, it was impossible to be a woman and not know a lot of abortion stories by the time you, know, you got into into a certain point in your life. And um, so I did start writing about it, but for me it seemed like one of those topics that would be discussed by male editors as confessional, you know, confessional mm -hmm. poetry about the body, poetry by women in the tradition of Anne Sexton that focused too much on the body and bodily functions and parts and things that only women think about. So I didn't write about it um, for a while, but then I did eventually, and I did, and, and I did get some poems published only in journals edited by women. So I was right about those male editors. And, and now I think, I don't know what the reception would be in mainstream journals, but I think it would be much better, particularly since there are so many more 
female editors, right? Don't you think, Annie? Is that true? Um, I mean, there definitely are more editors who are women. Yeah. So are abortion poems mainstream? Have they been mainstreamed at all? That's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, it's not... I I'm haven't, not so sure it's as mainstream. Yeah. I, I uh, mean, yeah, it's still I'm kind of so a taboo. Sure. And, and that was the yeah. other thing. I remember at the time when I had my own experience, it was something I could discuss with anyone. Um, I didn't discuss it with the other person involved, uh, and I did have a friend go with me. And it was a perfectly wonderful experience. It was very nurturing and, and very, it was very easy because it was such an early abortion. But years later, over the years, I, I have sisters that I'm very close to, and I, I was thinking about this today. I've hardly ever really discussed it with them. Um, and I still feel that way. It's not something, when you bring it up, if you ever do, which I don't very often, um, it is something that people are still very uncomfortable about, and there's still kind of a taboo, I think, on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, getting back to the poem. Um, so this poem is a sonnet. Um, Annie and I met 30 years ago, I figured it out, 30 years ago in 1994, when she did her first breakthrough anthology on women's poetry by form, informed by women, A Formal Feeling Comes, Contemporary Poetry Informed by Women. It was a wonderful, wonderful, major, yes. major breakthrough anthology. Yes. She really she really did all the, the work of digging and finding and researching and gathering together poems in traditional forms by contemporary women. Some male poets had been doing this um, on their own and had formed kind of a, a boys club with, you know, blue button down Oxford shirts and khaki pants and, and all of the uniform. And they were uh, doing a very good job of putting together collections and anthologies of metrical poetry by young male poets. Yeah, yeah, very conservative politically yeah, and yeah. socially. But Annie, Annie just kind of, um, she really disrupted them and she kind of joined them, but she also just kind of went off on her own and, and gathered together the poems by women who were writing in form. So that's how we met uh, 30 years ago. And she and her husband at the time, uh, I mean, he's still your husband. <laughs> at the time, she and her husband, uh, Glenn, right? Glenn uh, came to my house and they stayed overnight and uh, she has a son who's close to my son's age. So our sons played together, they were only four years old. That's one of the reasons I know it's been 30 years because right. now my son is 34. Uh, anyway, and so when I was thinking about tonight, I was thinking, oh my God, you know, I remember this first anthology coming out and the celebration and, and all the work that Annie has done on, especially on poetic meters just all the incredible mm. research and writing and, and studying and analysis of not just the traditional line of iambic pentameter, but all the other meters that male, the male poets had kind of, kind of just almost disparaged and considered less important. So she's done so much work and, and that was all about the celebration of form in, um, among women poets. And now this is a very different occasion because now we're addressing this political topic which is so painful and so, um, but it's out there, it's so personal, but it's, and uh, which kind of brings me back to my initial comment about feeling strange about tonight. Um, but I'm very glad to be here, of course. And so this poem is a sonnet, and I, I wrote it not very recently, but not too long ago. It was, there was a lot of, a lot of news about violence against abortion clinics and abortion providers. And, scary and uh, it's about a scene at a clinic where a young woman is going in and then she is her, I would call it harassed um, but and there was a lot of legalese in the air at the time and I remember hearing reports like words like injunction which is in the poem uh, and talk about the legal you know the little fine details about how close you could step if you wanted to protest against abortion how close you could get to the young woman going in and how what you could or couldn't say and you know all these little rules and I guess a lot of people learned exactly what the limits were and what they could do which is what's happening here anyway and the poem is titled um, it's the name of the girl and I put it in parentheses because of course nobody really cares about her she's this young girl and her name is Amber so I call the poem Amber a girl holds her baby on a hint of hip She'd never known that word before, injunction. 
until the lady outside the clinic stepped as carefully as counting and did not come too close or shout. But she spoke to the core of the girl going in, whose name she didn't know, Amber. Volunteers in pink at the door. Then Amber, just a few more steps to go, walked away. Now she yanks a pillow under her boyfriend's head. Didn't he promise he'd babysit, although it's not even his, until he gets a job? And then the girl, just like the lady said, will find a way. She hasn't seen the lady since that day. Mm -hmm. Do you read that again, Deborah, please? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to read it again? Okay. <laughs> okay. Amber. The girl holds her baby. Oh, let me just say that in the first line, it's after she's had, she did decide to have the baby, and it's later. That's, I hope that's not confusing. It's always hard when you're doing a reading. People don't know your poem. Okay. A girl holds her baby on a hint of hip. She'd never known that word before. Injunction. Until the lady outside the clinic stepped as carefully as counting and did not come too close or shout, but she spoke to the core of the girl going in, whose name she didn't know, Amber. Volunteers in pink at the door. Then Amber, just a few more steps to go, walked away. Now she yanks a pillow under her boyfriend's head. Didn't he promise he'd babysit, although it's not even his, until he gets a job? And then the girl, just like the lady said, will find a way. She hasn't seen the lady since that day. Ow. Yeah. Hmm. Anyone hear that one more time? Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so they believe in reading poems three times. Hmm? Yeah, it, it's pregnant with yes. so much. I mean, <laughs> Deborah's poetry is like that. Every word really counts. Yeah. 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 So we do one more time. It's only like in the last line you figure out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. One more time. It's it's such okay. a subtle poem. Thank you. Okay. Amber. A girl holds her baby on a hint of hip. She'd never known that word before. Injunction until the lady outside the clinic stepped as carefully as counting and did not come too close or shout, but she spoke to the core of the girl going in, whose name she didn't know, Amber. Volunteers in pink at the door, then Amber, just a few more steps to go, walked away. Now she yanks the pillow under her boyfriend's head. Didn't he promise he'd babysit, although it's not even his, until he gets a job? And then the girl, just like the lady said, will find a way. She hasn't seen the lady since that day. Page and um, it really stands out the way the, the rhyme. Hip injunction stepped, come, cord, no, door, go. Oh, okay, it's a sonnet. Mm -hmm. It rhymes just right. Pillow mm -hmm. promise his girl. Pillow promise his girl. So girl and promise? They um, don't exactly rhyme, right? Yeah, pillow and girl are. Oh, no, obviously, sort of an off. Oh, pillow and girl. Oh, oh, so no, it's it's the C D C. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty loose. And then at the end, so the rhymes are kind of loose, yeah. and then that's why at the end it hits you. Yeah. When it's just like the lady, the girl, just like the lady said, we'll find a way. She hasn't seen the lady since that day. So mm -hmm. that rhyme yeah. just makes it just hit home, and that's exactly the thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like. She was, yeah. It's just really Do you think your own experience with an abortion affected this? Uh, no, the, um, because my experience was, you know, I mean, I was so, so lucky. Different. I was privileged. You know, I was a graduate student. I knew that I had a career in front of me. I, I 
certainly wasn't going to have a child. I didn't want to be a mother at that point, but no, I, I mean, this Amber, in my mind, is someone who just doesn't have opportunities like I had and maybe doesn't have any support system, which is why she's so susceptible to what that lady is. Very young. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very, very young. Nice yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, just the, the girl, you know, the hint of hip. Mm. It's yeah, just so, I mean, it just creates that picture of that youth and, and um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just consistently. And then that being easily influenced by that voice, yes. you yeah. know, that woman that doesn't shout, doesn't, you know. She knows how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then it's nowhere in terms of, you know. <laughs> yeah. No the, the consequences of that momentary, right? Exactly. Yeah. As opposed to in Sin's poem, where the decision was just so yes, <laughs> completely yeah. coming out of your heart. Right. And right. that was the one. See, it could have been in the heart section, but I put it in the mind section because it's really about how the decision is made. And mm -hmm. in this case, but Amber's so vulnerable in her mind. Yeah. Yeah. And in your case, mm -hmm. the mind is listening to the heart, mm -hmm. you know. That must yeah. have taken you a long time to make those distinctions. I don't know yes. that. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was very interesting. Yeah. And who, which would you guess was the section that had the most contributions? Body. Yeah. Right? Okay. Body, heart, will, spirit. Body was number two. Heart? Heart. Heart. Yeah. Heart overwhelmingly. Yeah. Heart was like ten times as much as anything else. Huh. which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the tiniest one of all, which do you think was the smallest? Spirit. Spirit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you think spirit would be the smallest? I, I mean, just for me, spirit and love are the same thing. And yeah. so when you just brought up the fact that we don't ever talk about abortion as an act of love, um, in fact, the yeah. opposite, that we... And in some ways, the reason it's so like this is that spirit has to be removed from it. Right. Any possible sense of guidance and love and being aligned with the universe and yourself in the universe, that's all spirit. Yeah. And if that's present, then anti-choices yeah. have no power. Yeah. And part of so, what has been politicized is why the spirit yeah. is in it, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The thing about the, the political discourse that strikes me is that it's based on individual rights. Mm -hmm. Like our entire political mm -hmm. system is based on the rights of the individual, which is great. Mm -hmm. It's very nice and very mm -hmm. fair. But I think it misses a shit ton of stuff when it comes to, and I just want to say, when I say women, I mean trans women, I mean gender fluid, mm -hmm. anybody, you know, mm -hmm. I just have to say women because sorry, I know I'm supposed to say people, but I'm trying to talk about mm -hmm what I feel is a different approach to reality mm -hmm. that is more, more matriarchal centered, which is not about the individual. It's about yeah. the heart being open and shared and communal. In my ex experience, I feel more myself in my, in my motherhood, in my reproductive capacities, as in my spirit, it's all one. Like, I feel that way more when I'm with other women. Mm -hmm. Like, and I have trans women in my circle, which is great, but I'm saying just when it's like a female-centered reality, I feel so much stronger. And it's not about the individual. It's really not about individuality for me. And so when the whole abortion debate is centered on, oh, she's being so selfish, oh, she's got to be unselfish, and they make it like this thing, you have to be unselfish. When you hear the right talk about abortion, it's so weird. It's like they think that the only good thing to do is to, like, do some duty thing. Like, it's just so crazy. It's opposite of the way my spirituality is centered, which is goddess-centered, which is just, like, it's, it's a different way of looking at things, and it's not about individuality. It's about wholeness and the circle and encompassing everyone who's there and, and respecting the freedom of everyone who's there and respecting the individual self-determination of everyone who's there. So it just seems like such a strange, you know, it, it's not surprising that the spiritual aspect is so missing mm -hmm. of something that is spiritually so crucial Mm -hmm. But I think it's a huge tragedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
right now that the most powerful spiritual reality of over half the population is being completely erased because of our political discourse based on patriarchy and based on ideas of the individual as the be all and end all of human authenticity. It, it, it's, uh, it just isn't, isn't right. Well, also the conflation of religion and spirit, so that you yeah. know when you put out a call and ask for spirit and spiritual calms, you know you get all this religion. Yeah, yeah you're yeah, going to yeah. get dog girl, or you're going to get people who oppose abortion, mm -hmm. so they're not even going to be probably mm -hmm. writing about it. Unless exactly, they, unless they write something you know, anti-abortion. Exactly. But, yeah. So the spirit yeah. section was by far the people having trouble dealing with the spiritual or the religious tradition they were born in. Mm -hmm. And there are a few pieces about um, creating alternative spiritualities in which abortion mm -hmm. is supported and understood, mm -hmm. which was exciting to me. But yeah, heart was the biggest. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is because actually of the spiritual mm -hmm. um, vacuum. Mm -hmm. I think a lot yeah. of the heart is about the pain that these people have taken on themselves mm -hmm. over their own abortion, the pain of guilt and shame and just feeling like they can't love themselves and the trauma that they've taken on, which is so tragic. Mm -hmm. Like you make this decision for yourself, it's a courageous decision, and then you feel like in order to somehow make it better, you have to feel bad. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is, again, that's the patriarchal religion. It's like shame-based, it's mm -hmm. uh, you know, obedience-based, it's loyalty-based, it's authority-based, it's not centered in the, in the authentic mm -hmm. trusting of, the, of mm -hmm. the self that you were talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of that heart stuff was displaced spiritual yearning mm -hmm. and spiritual anger, spiritual rage, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was really the reason that I I realized as I was putting the book together that the spiritual rage was my ultimate goal mm -hmm. in that I really needed to express. And you know, it doesn't quite come out, but now I'm writing a book called Nine Abortion Rituals where it's mm -hmm. gonna be very explicit, mm -hmm. uh, where I'm writing a ritual for different situations. Mm -hmm. And I'm now uh, developing abortion rituals that are like collaborative theater pieces where the mm -hmm. audience can cathartically experience the feeling of being held in a spiritual reality that totally heals you and doesn't even have to forgive you, but just like gets it, you know, of, of why abortion uh, matters. So uh, the, my piece that I will read from the book is uh, actually it's spiritual, but I put it in the will section because, <laughs> but it's also very spiritual and it's a spell. It's a spell for abortion. And, uh, and I also want to say that when Deborah was talking before, I, I was so moved when you talked about my first anthology <laughs> ever that you were in. And this, this may be my last anthology, so you're in the first and the last. <laughs> uh, and in between them. And I have found uh, editing anthologies to be a very powerful way to influence mm -hmm. uh, discourse. Yes. Um, and yes. to chart new territory. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you, you were talking about how the first one was so literary about meter, mm -hmm. and this one is political. Actually, to me, they are the same. Like, the reason that I work with multiple meters and the reason that I care about abortion are the same reason, and it's a spiritual reason. Because for me, poetic meter and the diversity of meters mm -hmm. is a spiritual tool. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, yes. I think, Abortion is, to my mind, the key spiritual issue of mm -hmm. our time. Mm -hmm. So this is my abortion spell for three vo for two voices, an abortion day spell for two voices. I wrote it as a way of changing reality. Sorry, I'm just looking for, I just lost it again. Two eighty nine. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I can't remember why there's no um, index, but I think we should put one in the next yeah. edition. If we I think we couldn't afford it. Oh, <laughs> we, with all the rights and permission. Okay. Um, we couldn't afford those pages. Okay. The work. Okay. Um, so, 
It's a spell, and my definition of a spell is words that change reality, words that transform energy. And the way that, one of the main ways that words do that for me is through the rhythm of words, through the meter of words, which makes the words into something physical. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of brings the words into the world that's the physical world, right? Mm -hmm. So it bridges the mind and, and the body and the external world, or will, mind, body, heart, spirit, to me they're all in a spell. So I usually, uh, I read this three times, like a spell, and it's in the voice of the mother and the baby. If you see it on the page, you can see that the mother's voice is in regular letters, uh, the baby's voice is in italics, mm -hmm. and the last stanza combines the mother and the baby. So mm -hmm. when I get to the last, the third stanza, you'll see me kind of doing this. That's because I'm being the mother and the baby talking mm -hmm. together, uh, shifting between the voices. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a spell. As I turn your blood back to the earth, I am life, you are death, and we kiss in the fire that is my freedom's birth. By the womb of our love's endlessness, as you turn my blood back to the earth, I am death, you are life, and we kiss as we move through the deep, giving forth to the web that is love-woven bliss by the fire that is our freedom's birth. As I turn your blood back to the earth, I am life, you are death, and we kiss in the fire that is my freedom's birth. By the womb of our love's endlessness, as you turn my blood back to the earth. I am death, you are life, and we kiss as we move through the deep, giving forth to the web that is love woven bliss in the fire that is our freedom's birth. As I turn your blood back to the earth, I am life, you are death, and we kiss by the womb of our love's endlessness as you turn my blood back to the earth. I am death, you are life, and we kiss as we move through the deep, giving forth to the web of her love woven bliss by the fire that is our freedom's I'm actually going to make a change here because I see, amazingly, I've revised it since then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I've made it more explicitly spiritual because here it says, to the web that is love woven bliss. Copies out there when you get the book. Uh, <laughs> just cross out that is and make it of her, capital H, because it's really about this goddess spirituality and to the web of her love woven mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. baby and the and the yeah. mother Makes are sense. Both yeah. the yeah. womb yeah. of the yeah. goddess. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Page 289 replace that is with of her capital A Q. Mm -hmm. And yet Annie you put it under the category rather than spirit, right? I did because the spell is cleansing of the will. So that was that was the idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could have been under spirit. There's another piece of mind in the spirit section. So that was one reason. Um, if there hadn't been another piece of mind in the spirit section, I might have done that. But I also feel that um, as I was putting the book together, the pieces that, the sections that really needed more were the will and the spirit. And they kind of go together because when you have the support of the spirit, then your will can be clear. Like mm -hmm. in Sin's poem, it was so clear. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that in there, the, the mind was listening to the heart, and so the mm -hmm. mind had clarified things, and then the will was able to just go for it, held by the spirit, right? So it all mm -hmm. goes together. So the spell is about cleansing the power of the will so it can freely flow into the spirit, into the web of her love woven bliss. Mm -hmm. Like, because the will, when it's free, I believe the will, when it's free, connects me to the goddess. I was gonna say that um, because we only have part of Sin's poem, that second half, I world. would have put it in spirit. Uh, you know, there's no way I would not, because of that marriage of heart and will. Sin's poem, I wanted it to be the first in the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate well, that. You know what, that too. Now that I've changed the number of the, of the five directions, we have to have a new edition. So <laughs> I wonder if I can make a suggestion, since we're kind of devolving into, not devolving, moving into informal conversation. Yeah. If we want to kind of like wrap the formal program and then just yeah. folks can be right. more right. informal sure. with yeah. each other since we're in such an intimate space. Um, yeah. But like really end good. with some affirmations for all the work that y'all are doing. Mm -hmm. Another shout out to Chicago Abortion Fund mm -hmm. and like and these words and all of your art, like weaving art together with politic and the ongoing struggle for bodily autonomy, for reproductive justice, for liberation, and putting it to words in a way that everyone can relate to. Thank you, so, thank, thank you so much. much. I also want to thank Haymarket for doing incredible yes, job on yes. this book. It's really beautiful. I mean, it is mm -hmm. so beautiful. It is like, I always dreamed of an iconic cover, mm -hmm. and then they came up with this, and I was like, it's, it's truly iconic. And it's really, really wonderful to work with. And the book is just so beautiful. So. And I believe we have posters from back in the day that say, abortion without apology, with the book yeah. cover colors. I have seen them at marches in, Chicago. I might have a few upstairs, <laughs> but that was part of it too. Is that it was cool to see. Thank you all so much so for being I'll with us. I'll post that in my department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're gonna.